Our project this evening is to bring together the various elements of this series of discussions on the mysticism of the Kabbalah. And perhaps there is no better way of climaxing our little program of research uh, then through the symbolism of the everlasting house. Nearly all peoples scattered throughout the culture systems of mankind who have attained a high platform of ethics or civilization have conceived that the ultimate purpose of human society is to create or reveal through conduct a way of life that brings peace, harmony, dignity, and honor to all men. In Buddhism, for example, we have the tradition of the Maitreya, the teacher who is to come and who is to rule over an enlightened world. Certainly the messianic concept in Christianity sustains this same general teaching. In Hindu India, the concept of the tenth avatar of Vishnu, the one who is to come, who is to restore the sacred institutions and to bring human beings together in brotherhood and fraternity. This avatar also is to rule over an enlightened world. We also have among most peoples the idea that heaven is a vast empire, that like the kingdom of earth, the kingdom of heaven is the orderly abode of the sovereign deities and powers that govern the world. All nations conceived of heaven as a magnificent palace city, a city perfect, like the New Jerusalem, a city wherein the blessed and the redeemed dwelt together in eternal bliss. The old Egyptians at the same kind of a philosophy. They believe that in the world of the gods was the splendid palace temple of Osiris, lord of the quick and the dead, and that from his throne this great deity administered not only his own spiritual domain, but prepared the way for the descent of his spiritual kingdom into the mortal world, where it would be led and guarded and guided and ruled by his beloved son, Horus, the golden hawk. Thus, everywhere, man had the internal archetypal vision of a world fashioned to his heart's desire. A world in which the evils that we know are no more, but that all things are ruled and governed in righteousness, and that after a certain length of time, the kings and rulers of this world would return their crowns and scepters to the eternal king, and that the great one who fashioned all things will finally be the full ruler of his redeemed peoples. 
this vision probably may be held to be a certain type of daydream. Every human being lives from day to day in the hope of a victorious tomorrow. We plan, we labor, we struggle, not for the day alone, but to ensure some kind of future. The way we live now, we seldom attain this future. One by one we drop away, when it seems we have just begun to learn how to live. But in the subconscious of man, the archetype of a proper life way has always existed. Even among so-called less advanced people, there are evidences of the same general thinking. And this thinking goes a little further. It sort of implies that this heavenly city, this abode of the blessed, already exists somewhere in the mysteries of the unknown. Long ago, we could place this city somewhere on earth in a remote region unexplored by men. Many legends still come to us of mysterious spiritual centers in the wide expanse of the trans Himavat, or perhaps beyond the Tibetan desert of Gobi. Exploration, however, has forced this concept further and further from a material acceptance. And we have come almost to a complete agreement that this better world this heavenly kingdom, as Jesus said, is not of this world, but rests in some larger and better state beyond our present condition. If, however, there are rules and laws governing the world, the older peoples, including the Jewish mystics, recognize that there were two orders of government, government by men and government by God. The governments of men might be splendid, luxurious, magnificent, and their palaces bewildered the senses. But these governments by men were in large measure corrupt selfishness, egotism, tyranny were always present, and the rich and the powerful exploited the weak and the helpless. Thus there was no real solution to man's dream of a golden age to be found merely in the temporal estates of nations. Long ago, when men believed in the divine right of kings and held that temporal rulers were actually governing by the will and sanction of God, and perhaps these rulers themselves were caught up in a sense of spiritual responsibility, things went better. But in our more modern historical times, men have regarded themselves increasingly as temporal beings capable and entitled to advance their own destinies at the expense of each other. So the golden kingdoms of the future mingle with the mysterious spiritual empires of the past and in the middle distance where now we dwell, there is very much of earth and very little of heaven. Also, we must realize that the archetype of the ultimate state of man was strangely related 
to this mysterious experience of man's origin. If the future is to become increasingly better, the remote past was also better. For in the ancient times it was believed that the gods walked with men, that the ways of heaven flourished upon earth, and that at the very beginning of time divine institutions were established for the good of men, that laws were revealed, and that the first civilizers of nations were divinely inspired and spiritually enlightened beings. These two are vanished away in the limbo of things forgotten. But we seem to have a lingering memory of the golden age that once was. And it gives us a certain symbolism about the golden age that is to come. Now when Solomon became king over Israel, he resolved to fulfill the work of his father David, who had sworn that he would build a house to the Lord upon the Mount Moriah, which is in Jerusalem. So Solomon proceeded to call upon the resources of his people, upon his own private fortune, and upon the friendship of neighboring kings and rulers and he resolved to perfect the temple of the living God in which was to rest the Ark of the Covenant that had accompanied the children of Israel in their long journey through the wilderness. And Solomon therefore brought together the wisest and the most skillful of workmen. And he called upon his friend and his father's friend, Hiram, king of Tyre. And this great monarch of Tyre supplied skilled workmen and materials and wood, which was floated down from the hills of Lebanon in order that it might become the very beams and rafters of the glorious temple raised to the honor of God. And the workmen upon this task were divided into several groups according to their abilities. And some were drawers of water, and others were hewers of wood. And some were made foremen and masters over others. And those who were most skilled were given the most difficult and important work. And they trued the stones. And they placed upon each stone their mark, the mark of the faithful workman. And also out of Tyre came a most cunning artisan, referred to in the Bible as Hiram the Artificer. He was the one that cast the vessels of metal for the temple of the king. And he designed the great curtains and had to do with all the ornaments. And he cast the great columns that were to go before the porch of the house. And he made marvelous festoons of pomegranates and wonderful wreaths of flowers and he also fashioned the utensils of the priests and a molten seed borne upon the back of twelve oxen. It was to be a great and noble house indeed. And though its proportions and dimensions were not great in the term of modern architecture, it was a building of wonderful and cunning design. And into its construction was incorporated all the knowledge of the artificers of Syria and the wise men of the desert and the guilds of workmen labored exceedingly upon the perfection of this house. Now the reason for all this 
seem to be, first of all, the universal recognition of the importance of the sanctuary of God standing in the world. In other words, this temple was a microcosm of heaven. It was a doorway, a gate, or a bridge between mortality and the divine condition. It was here that the priest could enter in and commune with God, and the deity could descend between the wings of the cherubim and bestow his wisdom and his laws upon his people. And we are told in the Book of Kings that this great temple was built without the voice of workmen or the sound of hammers. We are also rather clearly reminded that this house took 33 years to build, and that in the building of it a wonderful symbolism was involved a symbolism which many Bible students have not taken as seriously as they should. Later, Jesus told his disciples that if the temple was destroyed, he could restore it in three days. And his disciples and the multitude decided that he was referring to his own body as a living temple of God. The house of Solomon the king was designed like the mystery of the human body. It represented a shrine or sanctuary fashioned in the likeness of man, and all its instruments and vessels were parts of man's own structure, as was also the original, the temple in the wilderness from which the design was basically derived. Also we know that the tabernacle, its are and its sacred vessels, were brought from Egypt, and that designs and representations are to be found upon the monuments of the Egyptians, which are most, almost identical with those described in the Temple of Solomon. The Kabbalists, being mystics, could not be completely held to the literal story of the building of a house. First of all, they maintained that the temple upon Mount Moriah stood on the earth directly beneath the eternal temple of God in heaven, that the earthly house was a kind of a long shadow of the heavenly house that it was not only a symbol of God's habitation, but also a kind of covenant between God and man. Even more than this, it was the story of man, the story of the building of worlds, the building of structures, the unfoldment of society, and the final redemption of the human soul. Thus in the Temple of Solomon, we have the symbolism of the great progress of the world. In the early years of the 17th century, Lord Bacon described the great structure of science as the house of the six days' work. He declared also that Solomon's house, as he called it, represented the total structure of man's mental and emotional maturity, that it signified all learning slowly building in the world, that it represented the slow but inevitable growth of human understanding, that we are all here as workmen upon the eternal house which is sometime to be the symbol of a perfect human society. Thus the Temple of Solomon, with all its workmen, with its wonderful plans and designs, its arts and its ornamentations, can represent the universe itself, 
built by the orders and hierarchs of heaven. And it can also represent this mysterious invisible universe, the universe of human consciousness, the universe which man himself is fashioning through the growing and unfolding powers of his own faculties. And it is in this direction that the mind of Kabbalism penetrated most deeply. And to understand their thinking, we must go back with them a little way and study the minds and the thoughts of these old scholars and rabbins who sought to interpret what they regarded to be the divine destiny for man. According to the old instruction, and certainly the temple itself and the manner of its building sustains the belief, there actually exists upon earth only one humanity. Broadly, to this one humanity can be given the name, the chosen people. Chosen not by self-election, but by the election of heaven that the tribes of Israel represent mysteriously all peoples. For these twelve tribes, with their affinity for the signs of the zodiac, do definitely represent the entire order of life that is born under the twelve signs, divided into tribes, each with certain attributes and qualities and characteristics. And from these tribes were chosen the artificers, the workers. And from each tribe some were selected, both in the rites of the tabernacle and in the rites of the temple. Because the perfection of this work was the result of the union of all peoples, all faiths, all skills, all arts, and all sciences. Now it was quite obvious to the medieval Kabbalists, that arts and sciences as we know them today are not united, that each is an isolated course to which men have dedicated their minds and their hearts. The artist does not understand the musician. The musician does not understand the biologist. The architect may have very little sympathy for the astronomer, except perhaps some basic sense of mathematical kinship. All of the branches of learning are strangely divided as though they had been cursed at the time of the Tower of Babel. Everywhere human beings are striving uh, to advance, not only them, themselves but their causes. Great institutions rise, great organizations are created, and our cities stand as monuments to tremendous ingenuity, industry, sacrifice, and death. Yet with all this tremendous labor, we have not achieved a sense of brotherhood. We have not sensed that we are all working together for the glory of the everlasting house. Thus in mysticism, the effort was made to give human beings this sense of central consciousness, this sense of one destiny, that all forms of knowledge, separate and divided, are but the fragments of knowledge, that when we separate we kill, and most of all in separating we kill unity, which is the power of oneness. As we break up knowledge, into many brackets, our ignorance increases. For we become skillful in some things and totally unknowing about other things. As our general perspective narrows, our ability to live well as persons is also injured. We find we lack balance, we lack breadth of interest, we lack tolerance, understanding, sympathies. And little by little, our specializations and our limitations close in upon us. The old Kabbalist pointed out that one thing we must some way regain, and that is not only the vision of our unity, but the vision of our united purpose. 
It is not enough that we simply acknowledge that we are brothers or that we are friends or to go into some mystical concept and insist that somewhere in our spiritual roots we are one being. We must do more than this. We must do the works of one being. We must bring together not only our abstract concepts, but our practical achievements to realize that actually worship is the perfection of the structure of human society. That this structure will always be troublesome, inadequate, and in continuing danger until we unite our resources and build it into one enduring unit. The first thing, then, uh, that we must have in order to build this everlasting house is a place upon which to build it. And Solomon went forth at night, and he found the threshing floor of the Jebusite. And he found that this floor was used by two brothers, each more concerned about the other than about himself. And when the grain was being divided, each brother returned at night and took from his own store and put upon the store of his brother. Solomon, coming in the evening to meditate the place, saw one brother come and furtively take from his own store and place it upon the store or the pile belonging to his brother. And after he had gone, the other brother came and also furtively took from his store and placed it on the store of his brother. And Solomon gave thanks to God that he had seen this mystery. And he said, not by the rites or sanctities of priesthood is this place dedicated. It is dedicated by brotherly love and unselfishness. And upon this site shall I build the everlasting house of my God. So we look to find the proper land upon which the temple shall be raised. And we know that this land must be a piece of earth sanctified by unselfishness that it must represent that level in human nature which is the true foundation of eternal truth. That level which thinks more of giving than of gaining. That level which thinks not first of itself but of another. For it is upon this sincerity alone, this rock Moriah, that the house must stand which cannot be swept away. For if we build upon the sands of opinion, or upon the uncertain ground of false doctrines, our house will not survive. But Solomon felt that God had showed him the way, and he left this instruction to his son, to forever remember that wherever men of their own accord and in secret and with no hope of gain or reward do most sincerely and honorably and most unselfishly serve each other out of the love and understanding in their own hearts. Wherever this occurs, this land is sacred. Wherever this occurs, this house is set aside to the service of the living God, whose name be praised. So perhaps in our own thinking, we can have some idea of how we must go about the building of the universal temple. Certainly it must stand upon the ground of unselfishness. It must stand upon the earth of insight. It must be erected upon the solid foundation of man's virtue, his understanding, his consecration. For if it is not so built, it is not built according to the law. 
And if it is not built according to the, the law, the living God will not dwell therein. Then having this foundation, which is the foundation of our own nobility, our own trueness, as apart from superficial and secondary consideration, upon this foundation we plan the house. And we call upon the skillful and the good. And we give to each man who labors upon this work the wages that are his proper due. We give to each that credit, that reward, that recognition which is his right. The workman is worthy of his hire. And in this labor, each man is rewarded according to the skill which he possesses, according to the virtue which he has attained, according to the discipline which he has imposed upon himself. So in the building of this house, we must call upon all the skills of mankind. We must call not only upon those skills which arise from crafts and arts and trades, but the skills of professions and of sciences and of religions. We must call upon all, that each may in its own way make its contribution. For if in this house any part of man is neglected, if in the building of this temple any craft or science is not present, the house will not be perfect. For in this house there must be gathered together the roots and streams of all knowing. And we must realize that it is only when this is accomplished that a strange and wonderful impregnation takes place. For it is this union which is the resurrection of truth. Truth broken, divided, and destroyed, taken apart as were the robes of the, of the Messiah when the soldiers cast lots for his garment. All these divided procedures all these fragments are in themselves lifeless until they are fitted together to make one living thing. And it was the opinion of the ancient magicians, mystics, that all these so-called dead things, imperfect in themselves, when they were brought together and formed into a cunning pattern, that this pattern suddenly became alive, and that in the perfection of work it is ensouled by its own spiritual unity. It is no longer a mass of rock. It is no longer castings and weavings and adornments. It is one thing. It is the everlasting house. It is the house which goes on because the causes of death are no more. Each workman who labored upon this house was entitled to mark his stone. But each workman also was given a design and a plan. And each labored with the full realization that his success depended upon his keeping the rules of his own plan and others also doing likewise. If he cut his stone too small, it would not fit in. If it was too large, it would not join with its neighbors. If he departed from the instructions and fashioned it according to his own delight, it fitted nowhere. This is the law of architecture, that the great result, the harmonious pattern, arises from a lawfulness each workman duly and properly instructed and consecrated to the fulfillment of that instruction. And when his stone was exactly the shape and size that was demanded of the space, then he might mark it, and he would receive his wages as a true and faithful workman. 
and he would receive honor. But most of all, he would know that when he gazed upon the finished building, it could not have been quite so perfect had his stone not been there. This was the cult of the Dionysian artificers, the great Syrian order of builders who worship God through architecture. And this was the meaning and symbolism of architecture, that it represented a way by which men came to understand the disciplines of cooperation, that great projects come from men working together, that if all work together, the labor is sweet, and all will live to see the glory of their work. For it is said that in the building of the temple of Solomon the king, the joy of the workmen, the consecration under which they labored, and the dedication which motivated their conduct, these were so great that during the whole course of the building, not one laborer sickened or died, and that every man who labored upon that house lived to see its perfection. Now, obviously, this is symbolic, but what does the symbolism mean? <coughs> it means definitely and certainly that in the building of the universal plan of things, those who labor with the foundations shall live to see the glory of the finished work. The old Pharisees advanced the doctrine of rebirth. They said that only by this law of Gilgulam could these things be achieved. But they were achieved, in the symbolism at least. So we watch around us in the world today, as our medieval ancestors did in their time, and we perceive a wonder which sometimes, perhaps, we are thoughtless about, taking too much for granted. We observe the marvelous increase of the glory of knowledge. We perceive the skills which are developing that man has never known before. And in our hearts and minds we realize how easily this great gathering force of insight could be dedicated to a project worthy of itself. We wonder sometimes how so small and insignificant a creature as man so deserves the wonderful faculties and powers with which he has been endowed. These endowments are given to him because he is a workman. At the time of the building of Solomon's house, it is said there were only three men who knew the complete plan. All the others worked only in faith worked only according to the laws of their guilds, fully convinced that if each did his duty, the great plan would be perfected. <coughs> and the master of the work received each day upon the trestle board of his craft the tracings by the finger of God concerning the labors of the day. Thus, without full understanding, but in great confidence, disciplined by their integrities and their guilds, the workmen fulfilled their various labors, never questioning the glory of the outcome. This was part of the glory of the guilds of medieval Europe, the wonderful dignity of labor, the full realization that the tailor and the coat maker and the shoemaker and the cook, all these were useful people. All of them were making their contribution to this strange, wonderful, and invisible house that had its roots in the unknown past and its spires and pinnacles in the unborn future. All labor, therefore, is the building of one vast structure. 
A man has been endowed by nature with the faculties and powers to fulfill this structural labor upon a certain level. As he recognizes his opportunities, his privileges, and his responsibilities, he will become truly the master builder. So in the concept of this, we had a great social ethical pressure. <laughs> we had a program for human conduct. Religion suddenly became vitalized. And instead of thinking merely of gathering and worshipping at altars that would crumble away, these people, these mystics, including even the Essenes, who had much to say on this subject, recognized the dignity of man the dignity of the life quietly but constructively lived. And that somewhere in this great house, every man can place a stone. And every man, as Kipling says, can leave behind him this message to the future. And others will come and build. But they will realize that the past has also known that the old stones indicate the faith of days gone by, standing firm and strong for the next footings to be raised thereon. This moral concept tied architecture to ethics. It tied the science and arts of building with the great spiritual and moral problem of human existence. And out of this all came the simple concept that we have strongly stated in the Kabbalah, that this whole great procedure that we call creation, evolution, is the building of the eternal house. That this house is built in the universe by the power of God, but that this house is brought down to earth by the goodwill of men, and that the time will come and must come when men will pattern their worldly estates according to the great diagram or plan of the kingdom of heaven. For in the universe is the vast architectural scheme which man must adapt to the building of temporal empire. The Muslim mystics, who had considerable contact, as we have noticed before, with the old Jewish priests and prophets, were also very well aware of the implication uh, that has uh, become part of their tradition as well as that of Christianity. They were quite certain in their own minds and in their own sacred writings uh, that there was a mysterious pattern in space and that this pattern in space has to be captured in various ways by the ingenuity of human consciousness. Actually, men do not invent arts and sciences. They discover principles that have always existed. Learning is an eternal discovery. Every process in nature and in the life of man is either lawful or unlawful. Everything we conceive of has rules. Every process has its own laws. Therefore, wisdom is actually man discovering the laws and the glory of God, as sang David the king. Consequently, in all our seeking, in all our growing, in all our struggling, we must search for lawfulness. We must discover the rules of the great guild of the builders. We must know that there is a way to build this house, that that way is an absolute science, that if any inaccuracy arises, the stress will not be adequate. If the house is not built completely and perfectly, it will not stand, unless the weights and the proportions are according to law, the building will not be adequate for its purposes. 
or it will not be beautiful, or it will collapse of its own weight, or many ills will fall upon it, so that the building of a house is an exact science, and the building of the great house, the house of universal brotherhood, is also an exact science. We have tried to build according to good humor and kindly intention. We have done much with these, but not enough. We cannot do enough. Because purposes, unless united, do not achieve their maximum good. No man knows how to cut his stone unless he sees the men who are cutting the stones that must go with his. No man of himself alone can carve a rock and be certain that it will fit. He must share in the broad total program. And to share in this broad total program, he must elevate the purposes of the whole above his own ambitions, above his own opinions, and above his own ideas. <coughs> he must have one idea with all who are likewise laboring upon this work. The Kabbalah came into Europe at a time when education was in a rather deplorable state. The story of the colleges of Europe in those days was not a very happy one. It was true that Charles the Great, Charlemagne, had gathered the rather unoccupied monks together and forced them to create cloister schools. It was also true that uh, Charlemagne had broken the tradition of the past and practically all royal precedent of his own time and said that it was not unseemly that a king could read and write. This was something that was really a soul-shaking episode. Because up, at that up to that time, uselessness was considered as indicative of aristocratic superiority. If you could do anything, you were sort of in trade. If you could do nothing, you were illustrious. It's getting that way again, by the way. <laughs> it's getting now so that it's rather humiliating uh, to work. And if it was not for a small problem of eating, there probably would be not very much enthusiasm in this direction. But Charlemagne did sense that there was very little glory in governing an empire of fools. So he began to consider the possibility of being the ruler over an intelligent people as perhaps a means of advancing his own glory. But in that time, most learning, most true learning, was centered in the Near East. And the Near East, in turn, had become the refuge of early Christian and Jewish scholars. And the courts of Baghdad were far ahead of Europe in the advancement of knowledge. Many of the scholars among the Arabs who came to Spain uh, with the rise of the Moorish power in that region, many of these who came were of Jewish ancestry and are said to have brought with them the ancient books and rules of the Kabbalah. From these books and rules, such as the Safar HaZohar, uh, a new kind of insight was bestowed upon the somewhat delinquent European mind. It became more obvious that learning was not only necessary uh, to the advancement of people, but that with all knowledge the Lord must give understanding. And the Kabbalists tried to understand the meaning of understanding. 
They suspected that it was not mere acceptance, that it was not that kind of attitude that arose merely from the ability to master the multiplication table. They realized that understanding meant a different and deeper dimension of awareness, that understanding had to do with meaning, and meaning in turn had to do with the larger patterns of things that understanding was man's ability to grasp the universal purpose, whereas knowledge might be merely the perpetuation of his own opinions. Man could become learned in the learning of other men, but he could gain understanding only through contemplating the works of God and heaven. Therefore, understanding had to do with the vast laws around him, whereas knowledge might be merely the memorizing of some social code in his own region. Understanding also was the power that gave perspective. Understanding enabled the individual to live for the future, or as one of the older mystics said, live with the spirit of towardness, going towards something, that understanding gave us some vision of what lay beyond the horizon, which we were slowly approaching. And also understanding was this mysterious energy in us that made us decide to reach that horizon, even though the journey was difficult, and we might suspect that when we came to the end, it would only be the beginning of another journey. So understanding was the power that Solomon asked God to bestow upon him. And it was this understanding which inspired the great pattern of the building of the universal house. Men of understanding were the only ones who could work together, and this is still true. Individuals with true insight can subordinate their personal desires to the accomplishment of some larger common good. Without this understanding, we follow the old tradition that is becoming rather too frequently referred to today. You ask a man today to do something, his quickest answer will be, what is there in it for me? This is the perfect statement of no understanding whatever. And this is the kind of situation that means that this individual would never build a good stone or cut a good stone to be put into the house of universal progress. He is the type of individual who probably would go on strike when the temple was half finished because he felt there should be more in it for him. This problem, then, of understanding affected the early attitude toward learning and prepared the way for the Renaissance. The Renaissance, in turn, brought with it gradually the power of the Reformation. Understanding was man's continual searching for the facts of things, and the biggest fact in all that he could discover was this great fact of the inevitable law of cooperation. To achieve any worthwhile end, men must work together, cheerfully and wisely, lovingly and unselfishly, not for their own good, but for the common good, not for their own glory, but for the glory of the Lord. This became a dedication, and even today this religious dedication is strong in many peoples, and is one of our great hopes that in the course of time we shall gain the insight to advance this structure of universal hope. Now what is this everlasting house that we strive to therefore put together? What do we expect it to be like when it is done? 
certainly it is not going to be a building. It is not going to compete in glass and steel and aluminum with the patterns of modern construction. Yet in a way, every house that we build in some degree calls upon the same skills and calls upon the same fraternity of efforts, but the motives are different. Yet even with different motive, the same methodology must be used because there is no other, and for lack of it the house will fall. But this house that we are seeking to build changes its definition with the changing of our times. Back in the 15th century, one old mystic, who was also, by the way, a Kabbalist, declared that the everlasting house would ultimately take the form of a university. This was a good idea at a time when everybody hoped that they might get to go to school sometime. There wasn't any very great assurance of it, but their great dream and hope was that sometime they could read and write. Therefore, we had the vision of the New Jerusalem, the universal city of the future, as a place where everybody could go to school. In other regions, this house of the future, this wonderful temple of pansotic wisdom, was to be a place where everybody could get a square meal. This held inducement for a long time, because it represented the idea of the end of hunger, the end of want, the end of that privation which has always sat so heavily upon the multitudes of the world. We have a little of this today. We have a little of both of this of these lines of thought. In many parts of the world, the future to these people does mean education. The building of a great schoolhouse in their own land. To others it does mean a house in which there will be no hunger. That indeed, that it will be a house of bread. Then there were others who got a little further along in the 17th century, uh, the utopians like uh, Campanella in his City of the Sun had the idea and the vision that in this wonderful city, this new world, there would be a certain democratic state of affairs. The people would share that the profit would not be so desperately important, that it would be the pride of the city that it had no poor, that all would labor together and share equally. Some of the old colonists came over to this country to try that, but it didn't work so well. Some folks still found a way of doing nothing and being paid for it. Of course, they didn't have the skill we have in that direction now, but they were willing to learn. Also, these utopians dreamed of a righteous kind of government. As one of them expressed it, the ultimate form of human administration. The Islamic mystic said, look in yourself, look in your own heart. For well, this is the beginning of sanctuary. And within your own consciousness is the secret garden of your hope. Here each individual, perhaps sometimes under a bit of neurosis, creates an imaginary world, a world of the dreams of things as he would like them to be. And if we could know all these dreams, we might be rather surprised, for most of them would be very much alike. In our hearts we all dream of the same things. But we are unable to transform these dreams into activities of conduct. We have been hurt, we have been offended, we have been frustrated. So we nurse our dreams in secret. Yet under analysis, under scientific consideration, the beauties that we hold dear are much alike in all peoples, and they all have something to do with the building of a world of peace, 
I think all nations and all faiths of importance in the world today have the common vision of the end of war. The creation of peace, even our stoutest adversaries, in the secrecy of themselves, realize that only peace can heal up the wounds that have afflicted the world since the beginning. We have known this, but we have not been able to make it work. We have not yet been able to bind men's purposes together. We have not been able to overcome the instinct of competition and to create in its place a consciousness of cooperation. If religion has failed, at least to now, to really achieve this end, it rather means that faith, as we know it, has not been strong enough to overcome selfishness. But in the process of the moment, there seems to be a stronger weapon rising, and that is man's consummate fear. Today man fears tragedy far more intensely than ever in the past has he hoped for good. Today it is becoming increasingly obvious that this better way of life must either find its place among us or we may not be able to survive at all. This is a serious thought. This may force us into a re-evaluation of the work at hand. And if a certain stress, strain, or crisis achieves this end, it is worth its passing cost. For the answer remains as it has always been, that we must either understand or suffer. Perhaps out of the tremendousness of our need, and out of the stronger facilities that we now possess for estimating the magnitudes of things, we shall have new incentives uh, for cooperation and understanding. It is, will be sad if these incentives have to be negative. But even though they may start negative, ultimately their own rewards will restore their positive equilibrium. For as we perceive the practical workings of constructiveness, we can no longer deny its right or deny its supremacy in our affairs. Now there have been some who have attempted to visualize the utopia of the future. You all remember Bellamy's Looking Backwards, a rather strange name because it was really looking forward. But then even a man like Bellamy could not quite escape the binding patterns of contemporary things. Ignatius Donnelly in Caesar's column attempted the same thing, but with only mediocre success. These men could not know the changes that were to follow their own lives by 25 or 50 years. They could not sense the magnitudes of world motion in the last 50 years. But in all, utopians in general realize that what we call a perfect state today must be actually a world state. The only foundation big enough for the everlasting house is the whole planet. Its tressellated floor must be the earth, and the magnificent span of its ceilings must be the heavens, and its ornaments must be the stars. Nothing less than this one house, nothing less than this one world, built over the ashes of many worlds, can meet the challenge of our present consciousness. <coughs> this does not mean that we want to have a world of conformists. This does not mean that all who can build this house must have only one thought and one mind. 
but it does mean that each must have as a con common denominator with all the others the great thought in the divine mind. It would be too bad indeed if every nation lost its cultures, lost its ancient traditions, its arts and its crafts, and that we all came to look alike, and that from the north to the south we would wear fedora hats or torador pants. This is something more horrible than we can even contemplate. Perhaps total extinction would be preferable. But it does mean that in the great essentials of things, we must learn to work together. We must learn to pray together, even though each may pray to his own concept of God. We must give every man this right. We do not care the name of the deity to whom he prays. What we want to know is, is he a faithful workman? chewing his stone for this house of eternal progress. We do not care what his language may be, for his works speak for him. And if they do not speak, his language fails in any event. We do not care how far away he is or how near. All we need to know is that a dedicated human kind has resolved to labor together for the common good. This is the sacred place upon which our house must be built. And of course the early Christians were of the opinion that it was quite possible that this new Jerusalem would descend upon the stony, rocky crest of Golgotha that it was upon bleak Calvary upon which the Messiah died that the new temple of everlasting truth would be built. Well, whether it is the floor of the Jebusite, or the sand of Gobi, or the rocky crest of Calvary, always the symbolism is approximately the same in meaning. For this rocky place of death is the symbol of this world. A world in which truth has long died for the selfishness of men. And this everlasting house is to be an eternal memorial to those who gave their all through all time to make this building possible. So it stands upon the blood of martyrs. It rises from the graves of heroes. And beneath it sleep the giants of ancient times to bear it as Atlas bore the earth upon his shoulders. This house, as we look upon it today, this coming world, is a fair place. It can be much a garden. It can be filled with all wonders, great galleries and museums, in which men will study the works of men. It will be dotted with monuments to human achievement, many little shrines, like the small shrines in a church, gathering like little hills around the great mountains of the high altars. All of these wonderful beauties, these paths that men have trod, can be marked within this house as are the stations of the cross. Therefore, in this house, there is no need of conflict. There is no need of disbelief or unbelieving. In this house also, the scholars will come. For out of their wisdom has come the laws which made so much of this possible. The scientist, the physician, the legislator, the lawyer. All these, if they have been true workmen, have put their proper stones in this house. And to the degree that they have been dedicated, they have advanced it. To the degree they have been selfish, they have delayed it. But by a law beyond men, the building goes on. And there is a legend that when Solomon's house was being built, 
one workman went to sleep. And in the morning, his stone was not ready. And in the emergency, the prince of evil came and threw the stone to make his offering to the everlasting house. It's a rather interesting thought. But even the wrongdoer, even the spirit of hate and deceit, in some mysterious way, indirectly but inevitably, contributes to the glory of this labor. For just as surely as virtue brings the day closer, so sin reveals the need to be greater. Everything plays part in this. And we are coming very close today to a time when we must begin to plan this. In the days of the old mystics of Israel, there were mostly deserts and a few cities, and the western world was comparatively unknown unless the Chinese had found out about it. They did not know anything about the tremendous pressure of world affairs as we understand them, but the pattern, the trestle board, remains as it was with them. For whether there be few or many, all must cooperate. Whether there be little villages or great cities, the need is the same. It is ever the struggle against ignorance and superstition and fear, the struggle for the building of a nobler way of life. Now if man will build this house, this house of the future, his religions, his philosophies, and his faiths tell him that it must be a strange symbol. It must again bear witness to all the laws of nature. In the structure of this city or this temple, every inconsistency must be reconciled, every conflict must be um, remedied or removed, every possible fault must be corrected. Otherwise the house will not stand. When it is complete, therefore, it is a shining, glittering, mysterious, crystal-like monument, a perfect representation in the life of man of the law of heaven. Heaven thus comes to earth when its rules become the ways of human conduct. The power of heaven is vindicated only when man discovers that by no other power can his own works be perfected. So it is said that the power of God or the glory of God is revealed through this great work which shines like the eternal city of revelation. And it is built upon a great foundation made of the precious jewels of virtue and integrity. Now when this city is so built and its peoples have all achieved their proper labors, and the time comes for each workman to receive the compensation for his labor. That compensation will be indeed more than sufficient. For in that compensation he will be rewarded by having a world worth living in, a world in which all things that are real can have their chance. Now there is an ancient legend also in the Kabbalah that when this world has finally been made so perfect that it is indeed heaven on earth, then a double mystery will occur in space. Heaven will descend and occupy this house, and this house will ascend and occupy heaven. They will be brought together as one house. There will no longer be any division between things mortal and things immortal, between the human and the divine. Perhaps this is a religious symbol to signify the final identity of human consciousness with the consciousness of God. Perhaps what they are telling us is that this whole great discipline is a kind of yoga, and that in the final realization of it, 
not as an experience of consciousness alone, but as an experience of consciousness made manifest in the flesh of things. But when man achieves this marvelous insight, creates this nirvanic structure, achieves this Atman of attainment, that he will be united forever with the everlasting plan, which is, of course, the great house. In any event, our present project does not necessarily burden us with the direct challenge of ultimates. What we are concerned with at the present moment is to make our proper footings in this great plan. We do not claim that the vision of the Supreme Architect has been bestowed upon us. We do not say that we know the end. All that we know is that we have been given certain skills and that we are confronted by certain unfinished work. That the great structure of universal life is as yet unfinished that it is our right and privilege, therefore, to build upon the old footings only that which we can understand and know to do. We can make our contribution. We are not expected to finish it. But we are expected to leave it more advanced than we found it, certainly no worse. We are expected to have evidenced our sincerity by joining the builders of the past in passing on to the future a work further advanced in all of its essential parts. We do this same thing in the building of humanity itself. Human society is a great building. Through our children and our grandchildren we pass on something of a maturing humanity that must sometime come of age, and in its maturity shall glorify all that has labored to bring about this better condition. Now in the Christian mysteries, and to a measure also in the Jewish mysteries, because these were very closely related, particularly in their beginnings, there was a, a belief, a very strong belief, in a kind of spiritual magic uh, that anything uh, that was perfect became ensouled by its own power. Pythagoras taught this among the Greeks. He said that when a beautiful image was created, this image became ensouled. Not necessarily by a deity, he was not thinking in terms of idolatry, but was ensouled by a kind of spirit, a spirit that had a power to operate in the life of men, that beauty took up its abode in the beautiful, virtue took up its dwelling in the virtuous, strength made its house among the strong. Thus, everything that we do becomes in some way ensouled by the spirit or the power we confer upon it. The everlasting house, therefore, when completed, and being a symbol of the perfected world, is also in soul. It becomes a living thing. It becomes an entity rather than a mere entity. All of its stones and parts are suddenly melded together by a power greater than these parts, so that out of the labors of many there is suddenly fashioned one work, and this one work carries within it and upon it all of the virtues that have gone into the creation thereof. <coughs> Today these matters perhaps concern us a little more than in the past. Perhaps the old Jewish people merely wished to create a testimony upon Zion. 
a reminder forever that they had not forgotten their God. But their symbolism stretches out into a much larger world. And all humanity today senses this tremendous need, this great demand for security. Though in the early rise of religious organizations, that land or ground which was set aside for the uses of religion was termed sanctified. And it was into sanctified ground uh, that those came to rest who died firm in the doctrines of the faith. But this sanctified ground had other purposes and uses also. If those guilty of offense, of crime even, were able to reach the sanctuary of sanctified ground, they passed from the keeping of the law of men to the keeping of the law of God. Therefore ancient religions, many of them, had what is called sanctuary. That, that land or ground so sanctified was not only for the use of the priests, but was a place where the tired, the sick, and the sinling could find at least temporary relief from the pressures of the world around them. To a measure also, this pertains to our thinking today. For if once we are able to sense the meaning of this divine house, this everlasting temple to the eternal, it will mean that the ground upon which it is built is also set apart a sanctuary, not only to receive the dead, but to protect the living. And when it comes to the protection of the living, there are many things for us to think about. For in our little man-made philosophy, we have often forgotten the God-made world. We have forgotten the divine right of flowers, the divine right of beasts. We have forgotten that all living things, fashioned by the love and wisdom of God, have their rights, their privileges and that we, as the leaders of them, have our responsibilities and our duties. We cannot do all these things well now. Not only our, our, is our vision not adequate, but our means may not always make it possible. But we do look forward in the betterness of things, not only to a world made safe for man, but a world made safe for all creatures. A world in which everything that belongs to God is preserved in the name of God. And we are now beginning to reach that degree of our insight and knowledge in which this is reasonably possible. Again, science moves in with strange possibilities for us to consider. If the present population explosions continue, most of the sources of food and supply, which we depend upon today, will be inadequate. Yet this does not necessarily mean that we will all die of starvation. It means we will reach out into new mediums. We may find entirely new concepts of nutrition. The automobile lifted a great horror from the horse. And we may lift one by one the burden from all other creatures that have often sacrifice themselves for our needs. This new way of life, this new world, this new condition of the future can be one which benefits as it must and should all creatures that exist within the domains of heaven. And earth is one of the suburbs of this eternal state. So little by little progress is helping us to build a house. We have numerous setbacks because we are inadequate and selfish peoples. But we also see signs of the glory to come. 
we begin to sense that it will be possible for men to worship side by side. But little by little, holy wars will become only sad memories in the experience of the race. We begin to sense that men will all be able to go to school and will have what they need for survival. That opportunity will not be limited by birth or estate, but that we will be recognized more and more for our works and not for these artificial boundaries by which we have previously estimated the privileges of each other. We see more and more also the possibility of the spreading of ideas through communication and transportation. We see distant and isolated places moving into their proper spots in this vast project of things. We also know that it is perfectly possible to stop war. We have not yet fully experienced the emergency, the true need of so doing, but we know that it can be done. We also know that it is perfectly possible to solve most of the social problems of mankind with fairness and equity to all. We know that if we expended the vast sums of money we are now variously wasting upon essential projects that we could advance human health, human happiness, and human security as never before was regarded as possible. We know that we are gradually conquering the destitution of age, that by degrees we will help humanity to enjoy the full fruit of its labors in its older years. We also will be able to protect the needs of the young. Little by little crime and pain and these other projects can be conquered they will be conquered. But this in itself is only a motion towards something. This is not the end, but it indicates that the end is attainable. And what was once a fantastic dream of some mystic in rapture is now a solid scientific possibility within not the imagination, but the common thinking of large parts of the human family. But with all this planning and all this plotting and all this scheming and all this considering, we have not yet fully recognized the essential overtones of a utopian state. We have not realized that all of this is meaningless, essentially meaningless, unless it represents a dynamic conscious, voluntary cooperation with the universe for projects far beyond the security of man. That the security of man is only incidental. It is only a proof that we know how, evidence that we are willing to try. It is our first statement of sincerity. We have risen above the smallness of our common thinking and have solved our own problem first. This is not the end, but it is a recommendation. It is an advancement. We then pass from among those of the workmen who could only carry wood and water to those better workmen who did true good stones or who did plan the more beautiful utensils of the temple. We shall be advanced, and our wages shall likewise be increased. But our labors will not be finished. For actually, the great temple, the great symbol of this universal house, is man's citizenship in the universe itself. Man extending himself finally until he is one of the great creative agencies of nature. That he truly, as the Kabbalists pointed out long ago, shall be greater than the angels. And that man himself is a hierarch, one of the great creative orders of life. That his real labors begin in space, not simply here. This was the view of the Kabbalists. 
who declared that it was man's ultimate duty, ultimate privilege, to be one of the great hierarchies before the throne of eternal grace, receiving the commandments of the Most High, and going forth upon the winds like the cherubim to carry the laws of the universe to the most ultimate distances of space. Man has a, a larger concept of destiny, which unfolds in him as he outgrows his own immediate smallness. Man must become vitally aware of his own immortality. He must realize his life in everlastingness. He must gradually gain the realization that he is the citizen of a great commonwealth in space, that he is an ambassador of the infinite, that he carries with him many powers and faculties which he does not dream exist as he lives today. So the old Jewish Kabbalists in their concept of the building of the temple and the reestablishment of the holy city were not thinking that someday the state of Israel would rise upon the ruins of Zion. They did not really mean merely the restoration of Israel or the return of the peoples to the land of their birth. What they really meant, as old Rabbi Akiba himself knew, was that the return of Israel was the return of the wandering human soul to its citizenship in space. That it was the coming home of the spirit from the smallness and darkness of its own defeat, returning like the prodigal son to the house of its father. This return, therefore, to the promised land is the return of the human soul to God and space and the infinite. And these terms, which to us are very abstract, are not really as abstract as we think. Space and God and the infinite are word symbols for facts that are real. We do not understand these facts. We do not know how to use them now. But we have no right to doubt that the house of the eternal stands upon the mountains of Zion. In the Eastern legends, we hear of Chang Shambhala, the city of the gods, from whose ramparts rise the lights of the aurora borealis. We are told of the mysterious cities of deities and of the abode of Shiva upon the tall peak of Mount Colossa. We hear everywhere of the Olympian deities upon their mountains, and the divinities of Northlands upon the tall peaks of Asgard. All these legends of the great city of the gods in space above man are upon the heights of the mountains to which we turn, for they are the hills from whence cometh our help. All of these represent man's recognition of the divine government that rules all things. That there is this tremendous civilization extending in space. That every star is a temple. Every galaxy is a city. The Milky Way is a vast metropolis of worlds. There is an immense empire that we know not of. And somewhere in space is the capital city, the banner city of this great diffusion. Here rule supreme the powers that engender all things, that control all things. This vaster city, so-called, we do not understand. But we know that upon the pattern of it our own ways must be built. Even an ordinary city of today can only exist because of an interrelationship of activities almost, almost inconceivable to the private citizen. Have we, have we ever wondered how milk comes to the city of New York? 
Have we ever wondered about the vast world and network of sewerage and utilities which must be present to keep a city alive? Have we ever realized as we go along in our daily activities making use of labors of persons we know nothing of, how this tremendous unity and economy has to be sustained by a magnificent plan? And that if anything happens to this plan, even in an ordinary city, there is chaos, destruction, and death. How much more significant, then, is this simplicity or empire of God? We are all using it. We are all living upon it. We are all dependent upon it. Yet we have so little concept of the magnificent organization of principles and energies by means of which our various activities are sustained. How is it then, as Lord Bacon says, that God must reveal himself by miracles? For his most common and ordinary works are most miraculous. Everywhere we see this organization, this tremendous plan, and the old mystics were convinced that this plan represented a broad program of government that as the stars mingle their rays, so men must learn to live together. That every pattern in space is lawful and reasonable and proper. And man reaching out to understand how to rule his own affairs will find the answers in the broad unrolling scroll of life itself. So to them, it was not difficult to imagine this world and empire or space, a great country, populated with a variety of creatures. It was not difficult for man to assume that he had been wandering in a long darkness, a darkness biological and anthropological, that for millions of years he has wandered through darkness, that he has gone through the desert of waiting as the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And at last, after what science may say is a hundred million years, or a thousand million years. Men led and guided by some force greater than themselves have come through. They have survived more disasters than we can ever count or know. They have lived through convulsions of nature that would confound us. They struggled on through a prehistoric world with beasts far stronger than themselves. And at last, out of this long struggle, mind was born. Man came forth as a creature to think no longer merely of struggling for survival against the saber-toothed tiger or some mighty sloth of the wilderness. He came forth as a man. He saw his own image in nature. He began to think. He became a builder of cities. He advanced all kinds of knowledge. And finally he paused, as David paused. And he thanked a power greater than himself for having led him through this unknown world where he could not have led his own way. He felt that all through the ages his hand was in the hand of God and that as a small infant he was guided and led by an all-wise and all-loving parent. And David the king said that we may commemorate this secure way in which we have passed through the wilderness, that we may give thanks and tribute to this power that has guided us through the uncertainties of ages. In honor of this and in recognition of this, we shall build the everlasting house to our God. And this is also a part of man's problem. That man shall sometimes realize the tremendous wisdom that has guided him. That he shall give thanks for the eternal love that has protected him. And that out of the fullness and greatness of his respect and veneration and understanding, we shall now build the eternal temple on Mount Moriah. In this temple he shall give thanks 
and he shall build his temple from the very arts and skills that he has learned in darkness. And all that he has gained through the ages he will dedicate to this final work. Man is no longer wandering alone in darkness, benighted and helpless. Man now has a mind and a heart. He can plan his own way. He can relieve the heavens of part of their duties and carry them himself. He can become the true and faithful servant of the very laws that once guided him. He can also become the guardian of other forms of life as he has been guarded. And out of his, all of his dreamings and all of his hopings, he builds the temple of his religion, his true faith. And this true faith is his wondrous recognition of the infinite skill, purpose, and law upon which his life is built. This is his new religion, cutting through all sects and creeds, and standing as an eternal testament to the fact that at last he understands that he recognizes, realizes, and appreciates the wonderful world in which he exists. And he has built a monument to his own understanding. And this monument, because he understands, is dedicated to the fountain of all understanding, that divine grace upon which all things depend for their existence. So out of the clash of creeds can come the temple of this one realization, the realization of one divine power, moving all things, guarding all things, guiding all things. And as this temple builds, man builds it because of the increasing and unfolding regard in which he holds life and holds principles and holds truths. As this temple grows, it becomes not only a place of worship, but truly the golden age he looks for. For this temple is his new world, a world in which he proves that he not only understands, but that he is grateful, and that it is now his opportunity to build his trestle board, to design his patterns, and to prove that he has learned well the lessons which he has been given through the countless, measureless periods of the prehistoric world. So as he has come out of the darkness of the wilderness and has been wonderfully rescued by God from the land of Egypt, so man today is moving through materialism, through darkness, through fear, doubt, and war. But if he keeps the faith, as the children of Israel were admonished to keep the faith, he will be brought in the fullness of time to the good land. And here in his gratitude, he will build the house of his God. And all the knowledge that he has shall adorn it. And all the spirit that he has shall worship in it. And in that time, this power shall be his God. And these people shall be the people of that God. And they shall receive the testimony of the virtues they have achieved and shall be seated forever upon the foundations of integrity. This was the old belief. It's not a bad one. Perhaps we would do better if we thought more about it than some of the little beliefs that have sort of captured our minds in recent times. But time is pretty well up, and I have a couple of announcements to make, so we'll have to consider that for this evening. <coughs> I'd like to call to your attention <coughs> that on Saturday, July 1st at 2.30, we're going to have this exhibition of puppet and puppet arts from Mexico. Look for a while, though, we weren't going to have them. But with more optimism than anything else, I wrote a letter to the United States Ambassador in Mexico City and told him we wanted them, so they're coming. <coughs> in any event, they're on their way, according to the last reports. We didn't do it just because we wanted them to come here. They wanted to come somewhere themselves. And they wanted to attend a convention, so we kind of worked it out all around. But anyway, 
By uh, the grace of the United States Ambassador and other divine powers, uh, the puppeteers will be with us, we believe, unless some other less graceful force interacts, on uh, July 1st at 2.30 p.m., uh, Senor Roberto Lago and his associate from Mexico City will bring the story of puppets in Mexico. He will tell us how the Aztecs used them long before the Spaniards came, and also that Cortez, when he arrived in the Western Hemisphere, brought puppeteers with him to, uh, well, we'll say, engage the attention of his followers in their more peaceful moments. Also, uh, puppetry has become part of the national life of Mexico, religiously, culturally, aesthetically. And, of course, as you probably realize, it's becoming very popular in this country, along with the general revival of interest in folk culture and folk arts. In any event, on uh, Sunday afternoon, on Saturday afternoon, July 1st at 2.30 p.m., they will be with us here. And we hope that you will all make a reservation for yourself and your friends to help us to be nice to these people who are coming on a goodwill ministry here. They want to try to help to build a little better cultural sympathy between peoples. Uh, they are going to have not only a demonstration of puppetry, but they're also going to have an illustrated lecture on historical puppets and uh, upon the development of the art among the early Mexican tribes. It will be quite an educational thing. I have children above the age of about 12 will probably be able to handle it pretty well. And for small children, it probably will not be uh, exactly the best program because it will go over their heads to some degree. Uh, of course, children around 80 or 90 will be really at their prime in this. But anyway, we hope that you will all come bring friends and reserve tickets this evening if you can. I believe that uh, we have a little notation on here. Yes, uh, the mission is one dollar. program lasts about an hour and a half, and uh, it may be interesting to remember that on that Sunday, the following Sunday, we do not have a lecture, so it will not be necessary for you to make the two trips in two days uh, to be here. Uh, we hope that you will seriously come and join uh, in the uh, story of these interesting puppets. Uh, I think they'll be really very, uh, very interesting and be a, a far more constructive program than most of those with which we are more or less tormented on television. <laughs> um, I also want to say that this is the last of our class series at this time, and our next Wednesday evening class will begin on, uh, I believe, the 11th of July. You will receive your programs in due time. Of course, we have our lecture next Sunday, so we hope you'll all be with us for this occasion. And I might mention that if you're at all interested in the study of the Old Testament and the Kabbalistic lore, that you think of our book, Old Testament Wisdom, uh, which contains a great deal of further material relating to the beliefs that we have discussed in this series of talks. We thank you very much for being with us and hope to see you again soon.